Over the last year, my friend and I have played over 20 different board games and reviewed another 10 for a combined total of 32 unique games to figure out which one has the best miniatures. We checked out shiny new offerings, but also a game older than me from the 60s. Can anyone hold a candle to our Lord and Savior Games Workshop? Let's find out. The line between miniature war games and board games is blurring more and more every day, but the gold standard for gaming miniatures in our hobby is currently Games Workshop. If there was a 10 out of 10 for this video, it'd have to be games like Curse City or Blackstone Fortress. That makes sense for a company whose entire 50 year long storied history has been dedicated to the sculpting and manufacturing of miniatures. But what if you don't have that kind of experience? If GW is a 10 out of 10, then I'd call our first game, Feudal, a 1 out of 10. I mean, let's be honest, what can you expect from a game from 1967? 3M produced several of these games in a series called Bookshelf Games. Named after the slipcover that made these games appear as leather-bound volumes in a bookshelf, 3M's collection of games were made from 1962 to 74 until they eventually sold the rights. Sure, the models are bad, but I expected that from minis produced in the 60s. Not necessarily a fair comparison to modern manufacturing methods. So let's see how much we've improved in the 2020s. Well, 54 years later, I'd say we aren't improving that much. At least that's the case for miniatures found in Ivion, our 2 out of 10 placement. I'd label these models as unpaintable, or rather not worth my time and probably not worth yours either. This will likely be the case for all the games in the 1 through 4 quality level. Of course, you and I could spend a lot of time effectively re-sculpting this model with paint, but it would suck all the joy out of the hobby. These models are a blobby mess of undefined details with fists that look like meatballs and faces that look like a bad bedsheet ghost costume. Ho -ho! All the models from Feudal and Ivion and even some future games are bad, but what do I mean by that? Isn't this all subjective anyways? It's worth spending some time defining what I think a good mini is. Sculpting 32 millimeter gaming miniatures, the scale that most board game companies are operating in, is deceptively challenging. I figured this out when I tried to sculpt my own gaming wood elf models. You can have models that are cast in a less forgiving material that are jam packed with little fiddly bits that turn into mush. You can have models that are cast in that same material that are sculpted more conservatively and turn out looking better because they play to their strengths. On the flip side, you can have models that have really crispy casts but are drowning in too many extra accessories. These models often look amazing but are an absolute chore to paint. You can also have models that are well cast but lack sufficient detail. You can have models that lack detail and are also poorly cast. Lastly, you can have well cast, thoughtfully sculpted models that are a joy to paint. When I'm assessing a model's quality, I am judging whether or not the creators considered the manufacturing process and also the hobbyist who's going to paint the figure at the end of the day and made the right choices. Of course, there is never one right solution for anything, and we'll get into the minutia of those choices later in the video. For me personally, most good models live here. Most bad models tend to live here on the graph, but you can also find bad ones here additionally. All right, where were we? Despite my scathing review of the models in Ivion, it's a pretty awesome game. Ivion is a 1v1 dueling game where you control one miniature and it features deck building, different kinds of crowd control, and other features you'd expect in an arena-based brawler. Increasing ever so slightly to 3 out of 10, we have games like D&D Onslaught. WizKids tries to hide behind pre-painted paint shots, but we can't be fooled. Those eyes look far more painted on than actually visible on the sculpt. Additionally, some messy, glossy glue is showing up on the paint jobs. These smaller models have oven mitts for hands, and the weapons are bending. I feel bad for whatever assembly line painter had to paint hundreds of these models. Yeesh! If you're familiar with pre-painted WizKids models, these seem to be of a similar quality, and they're pretty low on the totem pole of what's available. Jumping to our next 3 out of 10 game, we have Unmatched. These models are only a slight improvement due to their increased size, coming in at around 35 millimeter. I am able to actually see things like fingers and some semblance of face details. I definitely have an easier time painting these figures when compared with Ivion, but I'd sooner replace them with far superior sculpts from the third party market. The unmatched models come with a wash applied to the mini to help with seeing the details, but for me personally, the result is so subpar that it illustrates just how little details the models have. A better cast model would accept a wash far better. Despite also disliking the models in Unmatched, the game itself is, again, pretty awesome. 
I'd recommend this game to anyone who wants to dip their toes into wargaming. The keen-eyed among you may have even noticed that I've lifted a concept from one of their King Arthur cards for my tattoo. <laughs> Big fan of the game. I'll have all these games linked in the description below if you want to check them out. Also coming in at three is Scythe. The mech minis actually have some really nicely defined rivets and panels, but when we move over to the character minis, they kind of fall apart in similar ways. With a character height of about 33 millimeter, the larger animals are good enough and we can see whispers of detail, but there isn't enough contrast. For instance, on the jacket of the Saxony character mini, he has buttons and lots of wrinkles in the fabric. When primed and base coated, those tiny little bumps will probably turn into just more fabric wrinkles, unless you're super careful. Scythe is set in an alternative 1920s Eastern Europe where you vie for land and power. All Stonemaier games are thoughtfully designed from the ground up, even the packaging, and Scythe is no exception. My friends and I have pulled this game out more than a couple times during our monthly board game nights. Before moving on, to your brief word from this video's sponsor. This week's sponsor is Gale Force 9 and their new wave of Tenfold Dungeon out-of-the-box sci-fi tabletop terrain. Tenfold Dungeon is a line of quick and easy modular terrain that lets you skip the prep and get right to your next battle. Each set contains a highly detailed modular environment with one-by-one -one grids, detachable doors, and other interesting environmental pieces. Best of all, when you're done, just slap that sucker right back in the box it came with and slide right onto a bookshelf for easy storage and transport. Since they pack down so small, Tenfold Dungeons are perfect for gaming at your friend's house, be it Stargrave, Infinity, Kill Team, or anything that brings you to the stars. This new wave of products comes in four flavors dripping with personality. The Smuggler's Den is a perfect place for your rebel faction to hide out, complete with a docking bay and gambling den. Daedalus Station is a derelict space station with an airlock, life support room, control room, and plenty of corridors that you just know some filthy Xenos are stalking through. Starship Vengeance features the crisp bowels of an intergalactic star cruiser complete with a bridge, engine room, and a brig so you can store those pesky space pirates. The last entry in the new wave is Cyberpunk City. Brimming with neon, the city spans a few buildings featuring a midnight club and corporate offices ripe for a heist. It's hard to overstate the sheer amount of details the artists have put into these sets. We glossed over a lot of each set's unique rooms. All of these characterful details increase the immersion of gameplay. Gale Force 9 has put in the time to really elevate these sets. And if sci-fi isn't for you, their first line of tenfold dungeons is all fantasy. There's a dungeons and sewers set, a castle, a town, and a temple. Each has its own unique bits and details that elevate the product. Thank you to Gale Force 9 and their new wave of Tenfold Dungeons for sponsoring this episode. You can find them all linked in the description below. All right, now back to our mantra review. Increasing to the fours, we have quite a few games. Kemet Blood and Sand features smaller 27mm models head to toe, and while they are better than the likes of Feudal, they won't be seeing time on my hobby table anytime soon. While the casting quality isn't actually that bad, the features on the model are so small that it would be fun for me to paint personally. Next up is Court of the Dead, Mourner's Call. I'm a huge fan of the Court of the Dead setting. Heaven and Hell are both essentially evil corporations vying for your soul, and Death is the good guy trying to rebel against the celestial powers. Friggin' awesome. Sadly, the models are a far cry from the amazing statues that Sideshow Collectibles produce for the IP and an even further cry from the STLs pictured on the back of the box. The models in Court of the Dead feature fine texture that stands no chance to be cast with good enough detail and there are some pretty heinous mold lines on some of the figures. The large minis are a bit better, which is a theme I want you to pay attention to throughout this video, but even then the detail is too shallow on the majority of the models. Sadly, I wasn't a huge fan of the game either. Warner's Call has lore built into the game in a meaningful and thoughtful way, which I love. My one large complaint, however, is that it has so many different currencies and they all convert into one another, so it makes it very difficult to understand what actions have value over others because at the end of the day, they kind of all earn you the same thing. Dark Souls suffers from similar problems, especially with some poorly placed mold lines, warped weapons, and even some mold slips. The left side of this knight's face is higher than the right. Whoops. The larger figures are okay, and some of them I might even describe as crispy, but all the smaller figures give off such strong green army man vibes. The board game attempts to emulate the video game requiring players to grind mobs for souls or currency to buy gear to prepare for boss fights. 
The problem is that the gameplay loop is much easier to accomplish in a video game and quickly becomes tiring in a board game setting. The boss fights are cool and well designed, but my friend group was never ready for them because the grinding lead up was so boring, so we just jumped straight to the fight early and got destroyed. Resident Evil 3 is a bit better. The smaller figures are actually nicely defined for small models, but the details like the lips, nose, and fingers lack definition. Similar to Court of the Dead with zombie figures in Resident Evil 3, a lot of that goobery undead detail is very hard to see now, let alone after I try to apply layers of acrylic paint. The game itself didn't seem to play well as a one-off and probably wants gamers to experience the campaign system. There was lots of killing the same mob and ultimately it didn't feel that challenging. Increasing to the fives, we've now hit the fat middle. Aeon's Trespass Odyssey is a massive game featuring tons of miniatures and they're pretty okay. Like with most games, the larger figures carry the smaller figures in terms of detail because big figs are easy to cast because all details are bigger. It's almost like leaning into that might be a good idea if you're trying to cast models in subpar material like most of these games do. Huh. I wonder if this is foreshadowing. It's a dungeon crawling RPG without a dungeon master experience. Set in an alternate reality Greco-Roman time period, you pilot large titans combating big monsters. The game escalates in complexity over time, which means starting out, it isn't super interesting, which is a theme for a lot of games in this genre. Another theme is this game has a lot of stuff going on outside of actual combat, which makes sense if you're mimicking an RPG experience, but for me, isn't always preferred. There are many games in this genre, and most of them kind of differ on theme. I feel like for me, in the amount of time that I have, I'm just going to play one game in this genre, and this ain't it, Chief. The Village Attacks is a game I backed on Kickstarter because of theme alone. You play as villains defending your castle from invading humans, flipping the traditional script on its head. Some of the models are pretty good, but the product as a whole is weighed down by others with far too much undefined gobbledygook or warped weapons. Is that a beard or facial burns? You decide. Nemesis has some big, awesome, crispy looking bugs. I can actually tell that whatever casting methodology and material Awakened Realms picked was better than your standard board game. Sadly, this also makes the mold lines more obvious and obnoxious, and the smaller character figures are basically true scale. True scale means that if you took a regular sized human and shrunk them down to miniature size, this is the model you'd get. For the layman, you might be asking, how else is it supposed to work? I'll show you with a future game. Super thin arms, smaller heads, and mushy, hard-to-read volumes on these humanoid figures. If this game was only alien models, I'd definitely place this game a little bit higher in the rankings. Bardsung plays a similar tune to Nemesis with the small models, especially the dwarves, really tanking the ratings for the other figures. It isn't like the other models are especially amazing, however. They're very middling. The characters are also cast in this obnoxious orange color that, to the untrained eye, make the models look worse. For a board game where most people are probably not painting the figures, you'd probably want a different color and finish. This can really impact the perceived quality of your models. Bloodborne, the board game, was one that I had originally estimated would be lower, but the smaller figures rendered out pretty nicely. They don't bite off more than they can chew for the most part. The other figures in this game are also larger and cleanly cast, which sets it apart from Resident Evil 3, which has very similar character figures, but disappointing zombies. The gameplay also has some fun flavor, my favorite rule being if you don't know a ruling, pick whatever option is worse for you. Despite that, there are too many cards to a fault, and some of the rules were poorly written, but the combat featured no dice and was actually pretty interesting. Last and best of the fives is Lord of the Rings Journey into Middle-Earth. How do you make a model feel larger without literally increasing its height? You sculpt your models in heroic scale, like with the figures from this game. The hands, heads, and other features are enlarged to make them easier to manufacture, but also easier to paint. I think Fantasy Flight probably went a little too cartoony for my tastes with these renditions of our favorite characters from Lord of the Rings, but it's still far better quantitatively than a more reserved figure with worse detail. Most models in board games in general are some form of heroic scale, but it's most obvious with Journey into Middle-Earth. As far as gameplay goes, my friends and I actually started a campaign of this game and are having a lot of fun, and it's pretty challenging on normal difficulty. It feels like if you don't min-max your activations nearly perfectly, you'll lose the scenario, which has been the case so far for the first three missions we've played. 
This game also features no dice for combat and skill checks and starts simply like Aeon's Trespass, but I was more willing to check it out because I enjoy the world of Tolkien more than Jason and the Argonauts, for instance. All right, we're out of the murky middle. Before we get on to the better games, I want to take a brief segue into some different options that have unique models and are a bit harder to compare. Consider this the honorable mentions. Townsfolk Tussle features larger figures that emulate the cuphead aesthetic and the designs are very simple. This is kind of a good thing and a bad thing. On one hand, their designs don't feature details that turn into mush once cast in plastic. Everything is nice and clean, but there isn't much interest there in the first place, which might not be fun to paint for some. We had some fun playing the game, however. The experience dripped personality, and I always appreciate a game that scales up difficulty based on the number of players. Next up, we have Marvel United that has a chibi or a big-headed rendition of our favorite heroes and villains from the Marvel Universe. I like these models more than the Townsfolk Tussle Minis because while they are simply and clearly defined, the Marvel United characters still have interesting volumes. Instead of the arm being a uniform cylinder, the arm has interesting muscles, which makes it more fun to paint. The gameplay was similar to Pandemic, but unique enough to make it worthwhile. You can also play as the villain, and the role isn't meaningless like in Blackstone Fortress. Instead of being a puppeteer to a wholly AI-driven system, you can make meaningful choices and compete against the other heroes. Last on our list of unique models is Relic, a fun game based on Talisman, but in the 40k universe that features busts as the figures you use in-game. This is a pretty old game, relatively speaking, and the models hold up well. I've seen a painted set of these models on the internet on more than one occasion. All right, that's it for our honorable mentions. Now on to the sixes. Oathsworn is another D&D in a box board game, but this one features larger scale figures for its standard miniatures, and it helps a lot. Honestly, this is such a simple solution to the problem of cheap Chinese plastic casting. Just make the models bigger. Combat is compelling right out of the gate, no grinding required. The game has a really interesting mechanic for tracking the cooldowns of spells, which I really enjoyed. Of all the games I've played in this genre, this is definitely my favorite. The Others and Blood Rage definitely live in a similar world. Both of these are older Simon games, so they're not as nice as the newer ones, but still good. Simon has a good grasp on how to sculpt models in a heroic scale without it being too obvious, but still good enough to help with painting and detail rendering. There are some models that aren't so great, but for the most part, the standard 32mm figures, even the non-playable chaff, are really good. I cut my teeth on speed painting single figures with the others, and I think a game like this is a great starting place for learning those skills. I love resetting my hobby brain with a one to two hour speed paint of a board game model of this quality. The others was not a hit with my friend group as it featured out of the box game breaking strategies that the players could employ. Blood Rage, far and away, is the Simon game I have most time invested in. It's one of my favorites without a doubt, featuring deck drafting, area control, combat, and more. Rising Sun and Zombicide Undead or Alive are still very much so in the sixth category, but they're definitely better minis from Simon when compared with their older offerings. It's nice to see that they're getting better over time, but they've kind of plateaued as a company as far as model quality goes. Rising Sun in particular has a lot of amazing larger figures. I enjoyed playing Rising Sun. It reminded me a lot of Risk and Blood Rage as far as area control goes, with a fun bidding mechanic to earn certain deities' favor. You can form alliances with other players and rules to support that are built into the game, and it's kind of balanced because of that, but it always feels bad to get ganged up on regardless in a 2v1 situation. Last of the sixes, we have Black Rose Wars, and while the minis aren't substantially better than the other sixes, Ludus Magnus, the developers of this game, have done something that I wish other developers and publishers would do. They licensed their IP to a company that actually knows how to sculpt and cast miniatures. Chimera, a familiar name to us mini painters, ran a Kickstarter campaign called Tenebrae, Fate of Asteria, and that featured resin cast versions of the characters from this game, and they are so much better. As a painter, I'd love to have a limited time offering like this for the games I enjoy concepts from. It makes so much sense to hand off this job to a company with more experience, and it shows. Does this make the models in this game better than Rising Sun and Oathsworn? Not necessarily, but this is my video and I'm awarding brownie points for innovation. On paper, this game is awesome. You duel it out as a wizard against other wizards, selecting a branch of magic to invest in, whether it's necromancy or transmutation. Despite the cool concept, the game feels a little bloated with unnecessary rules and a ton of cards, but I see the potential. Time to crack the seal on the sevens with Street Fighter the Miniatures game. Again, just like with Oathworn, the solution to get great models is to make them big, and that's what Angry Joe, the YouTuber and developer of this game, did. 
Standing tall at 75 millimeters, these figures feel more like statues than miniatures. It might feel that way because they lack detail in a volume sense. There isn't a whole lot going on other than rippling muscles, but what is there is very clearly defined. As far as gameplay goes, this is one of my favorite games to play. The inspiration from the video game is obvious, but it's done in a way that works for the board game as well. The game plays pretty quickly, and trying to chain combos is a fun mental puzzle for my brain to chew on. Definitely want to play this one again. After Street Fighter is Deep Rock Galactic. Mood, the publisher, picked a great scale and have very cleanly sculpted designs. Next on the list is Super Fantasy Brawl that features larger figures similar to Street Fighter but with a good amount of clear and defined detail that someone from the miniature painting hobby might come to expect. The aesthetic reminds me of something out of a Blizzard game. This was also one of my favorite games and we went on to play it during a live stream as well. It strikes this perfect balance of complexity in board games for me. I'm not looking to play most board games a ton of times to perfect my strategy, so a gameplay loop that's interesting without containing a bazillion emergent strategies is perfect for me. Last on our list of sevens, we have Darkest Dungeons, published by the same company as Super Fantasy Brawl. These models are practically half the size of the minis found in that game. However, they're still pretty dang good. I remember opening the box of Darkest Dungeon expecting to find your typical board game fare, but was pleasantly surprised. They certainly have larger cartoonish proportions similar to the art style of the video game it's based on, but even the smaller figs are surprisingly good. Increasing to 8 out of 10, we get Borderlands, Mr. Torg's Arena of Badassery. Similar to Bardsung, we get more of that poor color choice for the monsters, but the other models in the set are really nicely manufactured. I might even say that the hero characters have a bit too much going on concept-wise, but even with that over-detailing that would fall apart in a lesser game, in Borderlands, it's holding up quite nicely. The mech especially is looking super clean and crispy. Next up is Hate, a game developed by Sima, not meant for gaming stores due to how brutal and violent it is. Yeah! This fantasy setting reminds me a lot of the 1982 Conan the Barbarian. Witches, cannibalism, torture, ooh-wee! Sign me up! If you want Grim and Dark, look no further. Simon is actually really great about hiring very talented sculptors, and on Hate, that was no exception. The list of participating artists was massive, as I'm sure it is on most of their games. I appreciate how many of them, like Patrick Masson, were traditional sculptors. The one critique of the game might be that there isn't a lot of distinction between the various factions you can play. Everyone in the world of Hate kind of just seems like a fantasy cannibal running around in a gimp suit. I gave Hate an 8 because this game features so many large and beautifully sculpted 75mm models. My favorite is the Umkal Prince and the Tyrant, both sculpted by Jacques Alexandre Gillois. Of the games I compared, I didn't find any that I'd consider to be a 9 out of 10. So for our last two games, we'll be skipping all the way to 10 out of 10. Maximum quality. I bet you can guess at least one of those games. Of course, it's the legendary Kingdom Death monster, specifically the Gambler's Chest minis that recently were fulfilled after a long 7-year post-Kickstarter wait. Grossing 12 million US dollars amongst 19,000 backers, Kingdom Death really changed the game with this offering. Similar to Games Workshop, Kingdom Death, the company, has a huge range of models that aren't included in this specific game that are beautiful looking, and even I own a few myself. Most models outside of the game are cast in resin and are nicer quality than the plastic minis contained in the box, but these gaming figures ain't no Black Rose War minis. These plastic models are some of the nicest we've seen so far, and notably, you can actually scrape mold lines off of these figures without the blade skipping and gumming up. Don't get me wrong, the models in Deep Rock Galactic are easier to clean than Dark Souls, for instance, but it doesn't compare to legit hard plastic. I bet that you guessed that KDM was going to compete with GW, but honestly, these two being 10 out of 10 is not much of a surprise. These companies are first and foremost model producers, not necessarily game publisher. So, can an actual board game publisher really produce models as good as a company that's been in the game for almost 50 years? Yes. Yes, they can. I don't know what Fantasy Flight is doing with Descent Legends of the Dark, but they shouldn't stop. These models look and feel like GW from a quality perspective. Sure, we can argue about concept, posing, and other minutia all day, but they are truly nailing it with these hard plastic casts. The craziest part is these minis come pre-assembled and they still look amazing. If you have a board game company and you're looking to make models, Heck, even if you've been making models in this space for a super long time, I'm looking at you, Simon. This is the quality you should be shooting for. 
If this is possible, this is the standard all your board game models should be at. I painted up a model on my live stream and the experience was just as pleasant as painting any other high quality fig. The game is pretty enjoyable and my group has two missions completed so far. I appreciate how each individual character has story driven choices they have to make that influence the future options they'll get. The combat is a bit limited in that you're only rolling one die for your results, which feels swingy. Maybe that'll change in the future, however. Well, we did it, team. We checked out 32 games and Descent holds a candle to Big Daddy GW. But what do you think? Let me know in the comment section below if you disagree with any of my opinions. This video took over a year to produce and involved coordinating many playtest sessions, pickups, drop-offs, and other miscellaneous planning details. Allow me a moment to thank the friends that made this video possible. Huge shout out to AJ for donating not only his game, but also his time to show us the ropes and run us through Street Fighter, Townsfolk Tussle, Marvel United, Black Rose Wars, and Rising Sun. A similar huge shout out to Ben who lent us Aeon's Trespass and Oathsworn and also taught us how to play. Lastly, thank you to Dan, Michelle, David, Evan, and Curtis for lending me Kemet, Borderlands, Darkest Dungeon, Kingdom Death Monster, Nemesis, and D&D Onslaught for me to review for this video. If you enjoyed any of the painted figures you saw in this video, you'll find their Instagram accounts linked in the description below. So give them a follow. This video would not have been possible without their help. So thank you guys so much. If you're a board game enjoyer who likes to paint their figures, I'll have some videos linked at the end of this one that'll help you with that process. If you enjoyed this video enough to give me some support, there are many ways to do that. All things linked down in the description below. Most notably, I have a merch website, miniac.co, that sells fun things like double-sided, self-healing, three millimeter thick cutting mats, all of my merch with a ton of cool art on it, and other miscellaneous stuff. You can also support me on Patreon, where you get access to my Discord server, where you and I can hang out any day of the week and chat about your miniature painting projects or what board game you're currently playing. My patrons are seriously awesome people. I would not be able to make videos about such incredibly niche things like what board games have the best miniatures, if not for their support. They truly enable my ADHD-fueled journey through this hobby, which, if I'm being honest, is the only way I'd be able to sustain a career doing this job. So to my patrons, thank you guys. That'll do it for this video, guys. Subscribe or die! And most importantly, don't forget to... <laughs> Man, man, I...